My name is Peter Frumhoff, and I'm very pleased to moderate this afternoon's final plenary session uh, of the Climate Crossroads Summit. Uh, uh, this afternoon's session is on climate science in the courts. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Senior Science Policy Advisor at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. I also teach climate science and policy at Harvard University, and I'm a very proud member of the advisory committee to Climate Crossroads. As a climate scientist, I've worked for many years now to foster cross-disciplinary dialogue uh, and communities of practice among scientists, legal scholars, and practitioners as science, and in particular various forms of climate science, are increasingly being taken up uh, in courts of law. I'm delighted to be able to further these dialogues here today with this distinguished panel. Uh, today we'll start with the panel discussion, leave time for Q&A with the audience, both in person and online. Uh, for those of you turning in, tuning in virtually, uh, we encourage you to submit questions uh, in the Slido box uh, below the live stream at any point in this session, and we'll have staff help feed those uh, into the discussion uh, here this afternoon. So let me now introduce, I just got a signal. Can people hear me? Um, so let me now introduce our panelists. Um, Camila Bustos uh, is Assistant Professor of Law at the Elizabeth Hobb School of Law at Pace University and co-founder of Law Students for Climate Accountability. Uh, Sabrina McCormick is a social scientist, documentary filmmaker, and founder of Resilience Creative, uh, which uh, produced the visuals, the documentary uh, uh, small piece of which we saw uh, just now. And finally, Michael Berger is executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law and senior research scholar at Columbia University. He's also of counsel with the law firm Cher Edling LLP. Um, so welcome to you all. Uh, we're gonna start with some recent news uh, and some context before diving into questions more specifically connected to science uh, and climate science and the law. Um, so as some of you may have noticed in recent weeks, we've had a series of Supreme Court decisions uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, many observers um, have seen as momentous with respect to science and policymaking, including on climate. We're gonna take a little bit of time just to unpack one of them the overturning of so-called Chevron deference. I wanna read a brief quote um, from June 28th, which was the day uh, that decision was announced uh, from a news article in Science Magazine. And I quote, in a much anticipated decision that many scientific groups had feared, the US Supreme Court overturned a 40 year old doctrine, so-called Chevron deference, that gave federal agencies considerable leeway in interpreting laws passed by Congress. The six to three ruling means that judges should no longer defer to the scientific expertise of those agencies on a vast range of technical questions and instead should make such decisions themselves. Uh, this, the, the article quotes the CEO of AAAS, which publishes science, uh, as saying that the ruling quote, will thrust federal agencies decision making into uncharted waters and fundamentally change the way scientific information is used in federal policymaking. No small thing. So let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, take some time and, and maybe we'll start with you, Camilla. Can, can you um, explain what is or perhaps was Chevron deference and, 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 and what you see as the implications of this decision on science and policymaking and climate policymaking in particular? Thanks so much for having me. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, for 40 years, we've had this principle underlying judicial decision making, which is we trust agencies because agencies are composed of experts. We're talking about really tricky issues, whether that's air pollution or um, you know health uh, inequities, anything related to climate, but so much more that agencies do. And we see a Supreme Court that says that precedent is no longer good. And by default, we're no longer deferring to agencies as the experts, right? When there's an ambiguous statute, we're gonna interpret it. And for me, you know, not just as a law professor or a lawyer, but as a citizen, I'm concerned about what I see as a power shift, really, um, um, a shift in values, but also a shift in, in how we see judges and courts taking power from agencies and saying, when there's ambiguity, we will interpret the science, we will interpret the law. And 
for me, again, as a climate advocate, as a professor, it's, um, it's bad news, um, especially because we don't know, it, it'll be hard to predict what it's actually gonna do when a lot of the cases come up and we have, a, we have such a range of, of diversity in our, in our courts, in our federal courts. Let me ask our other panelists to weigh in. Michael? Yeah, I think that that's a, well, let me also say thank you so much um, uh, to the Academy for the invitation and Peter for, to you for, for moderating the panel. Um, I think it's a very important point. We don't, we don't know exactly how the Loper Bright decision is gonna play out in the courts over the years to come. The challenge for agency lawyers and for lawyers that represent um, you know, civil society organizations is going to be to work within the new constraints, the new confines of the so-called Loper Bright doctrine um, to maximize uh, public protections, whether it be for climate, environment, consumer protection, public health, um, worker protection or, or otherwise food safety, um, you know, any number of things. Um, and, and try and maximize the degree of protections that agencies can, can claim um, under, under this new doctrine. It's not set in stone exactly how it's gonna play out. So there, there will be wrangling in the years to come, but there's no question, uh, Camila, that, that you're absolutely right. The, the decision expresses a mood which is part and parcel of a larger sort of um, moment in the, at the Supreme Court, certainly, and, and also in some of the circuit courts of appeals where there's a movement away from deference to the administrative state, to regulatory agencies, um, and the system through which they operate towards sort of a judicial aggrandizement of power. Um, and here, uh, with, with that decision, the degree of, of deference that a court will, will give to an agency when interpreting the law has gone from some to zero. And the question of how much deference the courts will give to agencies when interpreting policy questions or technical questions or scientific questions uh, is arguably less changed, but undoubtedly changed to some extent. And I'll just flag another decision quickly that also came up recently, which was the Supreme Court's decision in uh, a case called Ohio versus EPA, which involved a challenge to the, to the EPA's uh, good, good neighbor rule around interstate pollution. And that case is also concerning when it comes to the question of how courts are going to look at what agency, tech, at agency decisions uh, on the technical, scientific, and, and policy level. Because there, we really saw the Supreme Court express a willingness to second guess an agency's determination based on some pretty flimsy evidence that had been submitted by challengers to the rule. So I think it's part of a moment, um, and, and it definitely will be a battle that is being fought in courts for years to come. Um, well, just to echo, echo the other, our other two panelists, thank you so much. This is I, I'm so glad that the academies is taking leadership and having this um, panel on this very important and growingly important topic of climate change lawsuits. Um, if I may just expand the question a little bit further to another decision um, made at the same time, the Corner Post decision about statute of li limitations. I think when we take the constellation of these three decisions, the, um, the last two that Mike was just discussing on top of this corner post decision. Um, what we have is a, a total unprecedented moment in creating um, an opportunity for the courts to take a role in decisions, and I'll just speak to climate here, on the future of our climate that they didn't have before. And in ways that are very likely to be interpreted in, in dramatically, dramatically differently across the country and, and to the tune of decisions being very different in different states and different, uh, in different courts. And, and so it really does put a big question mark over the future of how lawsuits in the climate realm will, will play out. Um, having said that, and to the, to the topic of this panel, climate science or science in the courts, I don't think that means that science is becoming less important at all. I think it's um, going to be presented differently, received somewhat differently, and um, offers new um, and, and a shifting landscape for scientists to play a role in the courts. And I think that, you know, as a social scientist and someone who's studied the role of science in lawsuit and climate lawsuits for quite some time. I think this is an, a moment where scientists, social and otherwise, can take a note that to look at how can I be involved in informing decisions that are made in the court. And I think that's 
a very important question that scientists can be asking themselves now and into the future. So let's pick up on the role of science as it relates to the Chevron decision in particular. Um, what's the, so the courts are essentially taking power away from the uh, uh, federal agencies with respect to uh, uh, interpreting ambiguities in, in federal statutes, um, often with respect to technical issues that have since Chevron um, fallen to the agencies, how will courts access or how might courts access scientific information? What mechanisms do they have? What mechanisms do they need? Can you envision a time in which courts will actually have meaningful access to relevant science in order to inform what they're now taking on as decisions for them to make? Thoughts? Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a first stab at this. The I mean, the way that this type of case that would be subject to Chevron deference formally or Loper Bright now gets to the court is a federal agency issues a rule through notice and comment rulemaking. There's a public process through which that takes place. Um, individuals, civil society organizations, uh, subnational governments, uh, including tribes, cities, and states submit comments. Um, uh, and, and the agency sort of mulls all of that over and comes out with a decision. The court reviewing that rule then has that record before it. And so um, in this particular context, the way that science gets to the courts is through the science that goes through the agency. And that can be the agency's own science and uh, its own process, as well as comments that are submitted, which oftentimes will include technical reports, scientific expertise, uh, and so forth. So, the court will still be looking at that body of information when undertaking these kinds of review. The question is, how much weight will they give different pieces of that of that picture? And um, you know, I think that formally, one would say, well, the agency would give a greater degree of deference to the determinations that the agency made based on its own review of the science. Now it would seem that the Supreme Court has signaled that it's okay for courts to give less deference to agencies' views of its interpretations of its science as well as the other science that's uh, in front of it, and, and potentially to sort of nitpick um, and try and find small gaps in the record um, or small reasons to undo major rules. So agencies like the EPA, I'll just use the EPA in particular, are already subject to a lot of litigation, right, um, as they try to promulgate rules. Does this change the prospect or severity or extent of litigation that um, uh, a challenges to regulatory decision making that we'll, we'll see in, in, in EPA and perhaps other federal agencies? Does it affect climate policy making, for example, in this, in this context because the EPA has taken upon itself to interpret federal statutes around the Clean Air Act, for example, that will now be subject to litigation that might not have been otherwise, or is that a misinterpretation? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take first stab again, and, uh, but the, I, I think that the, um, every climate regulation that the Biden administration has promulgated has been challenged in court. So it's not gonna change the likelihood of litigation because we know that any pro-climate regulation uh, that any administration puts out there is going to be challenged in court um, either by you know, um, uh, Rep Republican attorneys generals uh, or uh, attorneys general or and or by industry, regulated industry and or by other civil society organizations. Those lawsuits have happened every time and they will continue to happen every time. I think what it, what it does do is it might shift the likelihood of success of those challenges you know, to a higher likelihood. The thoughts from other panelists. Also, ultimately, like when we think about the big picture, um, we think about legitimacy of courts as an essential part of uh, functional democracy, right? And I think we've seen this decision, among others, as, again, overturning precedent that had been there for a long time. And thinking outside of my lawyer hat, but thinking about, again, as a citizen, I worry about legitimacy of the courts and then what this means for the rest of us in society, right? If we're now saying we're going to throw away this principle that really guided how we understood, you know, executive agencies to function, um, and it may not change their processes so much, but again, there's there's this power um, sort of struggle, and 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 I think that's concerning. Um, I also don't think experts or scientists will become less relevant, but I think um, 
we have to think more broadly about um, what it does for science communication, right? Particularly in the climate space, which is already, it's, it's has been dealing with this question for, for a long time. Um, and I know Sabrina has done lots of work on this. But yeah, I think um, beyond sort of the weeds of legal cases, I think there, there's a shift here that's happening that, that we have to pay attention to. I guess I would just add that um, I think it's important to note that there's a very wide diversity of what at least I think of as climate lawsuits that land outside of EPA. Um, and I do think, and I, I'm really unable to think about Chevron alone. I think about it in this series of decisions. And I think with this series of decisions, I mean, the courts are going to be flooded with cases um, and involving EPA, involving other agencies, um, involving every question of health, well-being, environment. And, and again, I think of climate as something that affects our health, our well-being, our environment, all of these different, so many different dimensions, and there are so many different ways that the climate question can be approached in the courts um, through these different topics and, and, and different ways of understanding the impacts of climate change, the drivers of climate change. And so these decisions have really just uh, opened the floodgates to all different kinds of challenges and new ways um, beyond just the Clean Air Act, which is obviously fundamental to climate change, to regulation of the uh, greenhouse gases. But there's so many other dimensions that now we will be seeing in the courts, the courts that are already uh, backed up and dealing with many, many cases. Well, there are obviously huge repercussions to not just the Chevron decision, but the other ones that you've all mentioned. And we could spend the entire session on, on this. But I want to actually segue us to another set of contextual issues before we dig more fully into the science questions that are coming before the court. But before we go, I want to just make a program note for my National Academy colleagues, which is that our clock up here has, is not running. Um, so we're, we, I know this feels like a timeless session. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm sure time has passed, um, <laughs> and it would be good for us to be able to, to track that. So thank you um, <laughs> for that. So, so we've been talking about um, decisions that may uh, constrain climate regulation um, uh, and, and the, the potential for these Supreme Court decisions to, to do just that. I want to turn to another set of important developments, which one might think about uh, in, in sort of a... Um, advancing climate regulation or uh, writ large, right, sort of broadly what might get included, and, and, um, and, and motivating climate action through uh, lawsuits. So we've seen in recent years really a proliferation, uh, both in the U.S. and internationally, in the number and types of cases being filed that are seeking to hold governments um, and private companies, uh, including but not limited to fossil fuel companies, legally accountable for climate action from just a handful 20 years ago uh, that were filed to really a couple of hundred that have been filed per year in the last couple of years. Um, I really started to see a rapid growth in cases being filed in the middle of the last decade, right around the time of the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, and, and we're now seeing these cases not only in the US where they are predominant, but also I think now in something like 55 countries around the world, including several in the global south. So let's set the stage. What's going on here? Why are why are states or subnational governments, um, civil society organizations, and others uh, turning to the, the courts to address climate change? What kinds of cases are being brought? What are we learning from them? So let's kind of paint this picture. And Michael, if we can start with you, I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, so I, I'll start just by noting, you know, at the Sabin Center, one of the things we do is we track uh, global climate litigation and we, and we maintain a database um, of, climate cases that are filed in the United States and climate cases that are filed um, around the world. And, and the, the way that we categorize these cases is these are cases where climate change is a material issue of law or fact um, in the case, which means we leave out certain strategic cases that might have major implications for climate change, but are you know, focused on the Clean Air Act uh, and toxic air pollution, for instance, or are focused on some aspect of land use, but not on sea level rise. Um, so. Through tracking these cases, we've seen exactly as you said, an increasing number of cases in an increasing number of jurisdictions around the world raising an increasing variety of causes of action. Um, 
Most of these cases are you know, pro-climate cases in the sense that they're seeking to advance climate ambition or increase climate action, but a not insignificant number of the cases, especially here in the United States, are cases that are seeking the opposite and are seeking to combat climate action or slow down uh, government, government action. Um, the majority of the cases, some 75% of the cases or more, are cases that are brought under what I think of as traditional environmental, energy, land use, natural resources laws. Uh, so you can think of these are cases brought under the Clean Air Act or under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act involving environmental impact assessment, or under Water Act or, in, or concerning endangered species or biodiversity. So existing statutes or policies that are on the books where the, the parties are seeking to mainstream climate change. Into the, into the law. A smaller number, but the cases um, are cases that involve constitutional claims, um, financial um, obligations claims, um, human rights claims, uh, public trust obligations claims, um, or nuisance and tort-based claims against fossil fuel companies. This is a, a much smaller number of cases, but they receive a a much greater deal of media attention and public attention because the impact of any individual case in these instances can theoretically have a greater impact. I mean, it can, it can wind up in changing a government's um, overall policy. Uh, it can wind up in imposing significant obligations on a corporate actor um, or having some other sort of outsized, outsized impact. Uh, why do, have we seen an increased number of cases in both categories? Because governments and corporations are falling short. I mean, that's quite simply it. The, you know, the, the courts do not provide a, a silver bullet for the, for the climate crisis. They don't provide an absolute solution to any aspect of the climate problem, but they're an important lever of power. Um, and they're an in court, in the, a critical tool in the toolkit. Um, and when people sort of find other systems failing uh, in the United States and elsewhere, they, they go to court to try and fix the problem. Yeah, uh, uh, and Mike and I know each other very well, and we, as as our disciplinary backgrounds are different, we think a little bit differently. But um, you know, I was so grateful to the Sabin Center to be able to build on their database um, with uh, National Science Foundation funding, where we characterized all of the cases um, by a variety, about thirty different variables, actually, so that we were able to see who's bringing cases, who's winning, who's losing, what's the topic. Um, it, it, Oh, how, how much science, what kind of science is being used? And we're able to identify some trends um, really from 1990 to about 2017, um, that I, some of which surprised me very much. Um, and I'll just point to some of the most surprising findings. Um, the majority of the cases that have to do with air predominantly, which is maybe not surprising, actually tend to fall, um, and, and I'll use the terms pro-regulatory or anti-regulatory, um, they, they tend to f favor anti-regulatory outcomes, actually. So, um, but that's not true in three kinds of cases, renewable energy cases, energy efficiency cases, and biodiversity cases. And in the first two of those, so renewable energy and energy efficiency cases, those are much more at a, a rate of about 2.4 to 1, much more ending up on the pro-regulatory side. Um, the biodiversity cases are, are almost even, um, maybe uh, leaning towards being more um, pro-regulatory than anti-regulatory. So, those, uh, those cases are a real success story for moving the needle forward on addressing climate change, would be my judgment. Um, it, it's interesting to see a trend, a trends and changes of cases around adaptation in particular. So, I mean, it's maybe not shocking to think that the more impacts we see of climate change, the more cases we see trying to address the extreme costs, the lives lost, um, and the incredible uh, changes in our society that we see through these impacts. And so we see a rise in these cases, uh, even in the past, like, you know, five to 10 years, and these cases also being somewhat more successful than um, other kinds of cases, at least that, that we tracked. Um, I also want to, just being a social, social scientist, want to make the note that, you know, again, and I mentioned this earlier, that the kinds of science being used in these cases is wildly variable. I mean, there's just a broad range. I mean, I just 
for example, want to speak to the polar bear case. So this is the case that um, was brought against the listing of the polar bear as an endangered animal, right? This is the, the animal that represents climate change. So a group of, well, actually, there were about 10 different cases brought against the Fish and Wildlife Service for this listing that were compiled into one big case. Um, in this case, for the first time in history, climate projections of ice melt were used to make the argument that the habitat for the polar bear was going away, and therefore the polar bear would be going away as well. So that's one kind of science. But then we've also found that health science, so science connecting the exposure of air pollutants to our health outcomes, which there are many and varied both in the short and the long term, actually really helped plaintiffs establish causation, establish standing, which I'll let one of our two legal experts speak to um, what that is exactly. But there are lots of different kinds of economic sciences that are used to make the case about what's viable economically for different uh, energy trajectories. So there's, a, you know, in the press, there's a lot of attention to cases brought by children. Fair. These are exciting, interesting, and compelling cases, some of which are recently winning, some of which are recently losing, um, and, and more kind of scintillating ca cases which um, get more attention. But there's a lot of other uh, cases going on that really do have an outcome um, on the ground in communities across the country. Thank you. I want to I pick up on that and also pick up on the point Mike made uh, earlier about those cases getting media attention. Some of them are getting attention because they have potential for great impact. Um, uh, and of course, the question of how impactful litigation can be, the jury is out on this. A lot of cases are still being adjudicated. I'm curious, and Camilla, maybe you can speak to this. What, like, what cases are you, well, it, more broadly, what's your sense of the, of the status of climate litigation? And are there particular cases that you're excited about or watching or familiar with that, that you think are deserving of attention because of their potential for for impact? Love this question. <laughs> so I will say, just to supplement some of what, what y'all been saying, I feel litigation is really powerful because with climate, we've known that I think, you know, the public has had a lot of trouble understanding how do they engage? Like, how is it going to affect them? And like, I think for, for years, um, you know, the climate movement really failed to communicate that, right? We've talked about polar bears and we talked about the hockey stick and like we didn't really, I think that's shifted a lot, right? In the last 10 years, thanks to the climate movement and the way in which we're talking up across the aisle and sometimes across different social justice issues. And I think that's helping climate be not just an environmental issue, but right, a health, social justice, um, immigration, criminal justice issue. Um, and I see climate as, climate litigation as actually saying, hey, who's to blame here? Who are we blaming because of what they did or they're not doing enough, whether that's a, a government or a corporation? And that's powerful, right? To actually say, these are the impacts that this particular defendant is having, has had or will have in my life. And I, and I think that that symbolic aspect is really important. And so on that, on, on, on one hand, I'm, I'm really excited about just litigation um, and, and the momentum it's bringing to these questions of who's accountable and who should be accountable for climate harms. I think where I'm a little more skeptical or some of my research has focused on is, great, there's all of these different cases that have been filed. Some are winning, some are losing. Some really interesting cases outside the United States, actually, because we have, you know, in the United States, uh, constitutional law and administrative law, I would say, are a little less creative than in other places. So I actually think some of the most interesting constitutional developments are happening elsewhere. <laughs> um, but besides that, I think there's a question about, okay, we win a case, and then what? Right. So how are we thinking about implementation of the remedies? So we go to court, we sue. Let's say we've proven the harm. Um, let's say we've asked for a particular remedy. And maybe that's, you know, for the Department of Transportation to actually reduce emissions more quickly. Or maybe that's um, damages to, you know, help communities adapt to climate. It totally varies depending on the case. But are those remedies being implemented? Um, or is this going to be another battle where you have to engage not just the courts, but actually agencies and other stakeholders to actually have a ruling become reality? And so some of my research has actually started to look at this, this question of climate remedies and, and, and how do we keep this momentum going because sometimes it's not enough to win. I'll give you an example. 
I was part of a case in Colombia that we brought in 2018, um, and it was essentially a case against the national government for its failure to stop deforestation in the Amazon forest. The Amazon forest, as you know, it's, it's you know covers many um, South American countries and has an, a huge role, you know, in, in, in a stable climate. Um, and you know, we, we had thought about a lot of obstacles, especially legal obstacles. And those were not the issue. We won in a matter of four months. You know, went from district court to the Supreme Court of Justice and won. You can Google it. It, 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 it was quite fast. But then the question of how do we actually stop deforestation? Because that's a structural issue that's linked to, you know, the political economy of the country and a lot of other things that a lot of agencies are responsible for. So that's not, so even if we have this victory in court, you know, there's a long road of thinking, okay, how do we go from plans to actions to actually stop deforestation? That's just one example. So, you know, as a scholar, I'm really interested in, in climate litigation as a trend, but also thinking, okay, how do we make this, this victories, um, material victories? So there are, thank you for that. And so there are decisions that get made in the court, within the court of law that, that need to foster remedies that are sustainable and can, can be amplified. But there's also an interplay between what happens in the court of law and what happens in the court of public opinion, right? And that that's sort of a, it is a segue maybe to talk with all of you, but I want to start with Sabrina about the kind of role of narrative. I mean, you were talking about media attention and obviously, you know, court cases that uh, have big social justice implications are often and have been historically great stories, right? So Inherit the Wind, right? Or or To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm going to date myself now, or, or Aaron Brockovich, right? I mean, these are all... These are all great movies because they tell stories, or great literature because they tell stories about using the courts to stand up for social justice. We just saw a brief video from the, a documentary that Sabrina and her colleagues are developing that is also a social justice climate case, right, about protecting, uh, well, maybe you can talk about the case, uh, Sabrina, and, and more broadly as you've segued from some of your social science work to filmmaking uh, and documentary filmmaking, like what's, what's turning you to narrative and what, what narratives are you finding compelling uh, as you think about telling the public story about, uh, about court cases on climate? Yeah, I mean, I just, I just love, I love thinking about how to make these lawsuits into a clear, compelling narrative that people can really tune into emotionally. I think, you know, there's a growing amount of, of news media attention to climate lawsuits, which I think is appropriate and important. But I think mostly people don't really understand the courts very well, um, and they don't understand the courts, just general public audience, um, how, how court decisions relate to them. And I do think, uh, you know, there's, as I was saying before, such diversity of cases. There's so many different ways into helping people understand climate change. Uh, through these stories and like, look, I mean, Law and Order, it's like one of the longest running series on TV. There's a reason for that. There's a, a recipe for a good law story and they tell it every, well, not every week anymore. They just keep telling it and it works. But I, you know, I really see this also working in the climate space. And, you know, certainly there are things you have to sacrifice to make fiction. You know, cases take a lot longer in real life than they do, you know, in an hour long or half hour long show, you know, things like that. But I guess I, I turned to that more and more after I did research on it and saw such compelling plaintiffs and defendants who were spending their lives, risking their lives to deal with these issues in the courts, truly risking their lives, putting everything into a suit and you know meeting these people and seeing what they had had invested in a case and wanting other people to see that because not not just is it a great David and Goliath storytelling we all love to see the underdog come back and you know win which some of these cases really are winning now and I think in the face of some of the hottest days we've had here in DC recently, right? And various other climate related catastrophes, we could all stand a little, you know, hope and vigor around creating positive change in the, in the context of climate change. And some of these stories really are that. And the, the, I'll call them characters, the people involved in these stories are great characters. I mean, they, I want to see them on screen and I want to not just tell their stories, but I want other people to understand what they're struggling with, what they're overcoming and how they're doing it. You know, because I think the nuance and the detail is, 
is actually fascinating. I think it's really riveting. And I mean, I'll just say the last thing I'll say um, is, you know, some of what we're doing is, is fiction inspired by real life. And some of what we're doing there is really trying to just get ahead of what's in the courts now, imagine what might be coming next and try to imagine it in a positive way. Because I don't think people, the human mind, really can differentiate between what we see on screen and what we, what we live, what we see is what we create for ourselves. So if we can create and, and envision a positive future on screen for people, that's kind of a roadmap. Um, and that's, that's what I, as a sociologist who has spent my life working on understanding how we achieve social change, is invested in creating narrative that maps that social change in a way that people can understand how they can engage, they can be inspired, they will talk to other people about it because it's a good TV show that they watched last night, and it will engender more conversation and more engagement with what I think of as really rich stories. And I, there's just an endless number of them. So can I just follow, does the public narrative potentially change the legal narrative? I mean, juries and judges yes. are members of the public, right? Yes. Um, uh, I believe and that. Societal norms are not fixed in law; they're they're stretched by, they're sort of broadly defined, but they change over time. Um, so, how do you see the, the interplay? And maybe you could do this by example. Are there are there cases that you're trying to highlight that that illustrate the kind of power of, of public narrative around around legal decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've seen the power of narrative to create social change on all kinds of issues, from racial justice to gay marriage to, I mean, it's across the board, right? So if you just think about Will and Grace or Ellen coming out on her TV show and the, I mean, look, I can't do a cause and effect between those TV shows and the gay rights uh, decisions um, in court, but I don't think they're separate. I think we create culture change with storytelling. I think the courts are influenced by that because the courts are influenced by the society in which they're situated. Because judges are people like the rest of us. Certainly they have particular training and constraints in the law, but they are inspired by what they'll see on screen. I think we all are inspired by what we see on screen. And so, I mean, th those are just some examples. I mean, to the to the uh, piece that we saw as um, those of us in the room were coming back, Saul versus RWE, what to me is so, um, there are many kind of game-changing things to me about that story of this indigenous Peruvian farmer who joins forces with, uh, who lives in the glacial Andes, right? I mean, nowhere near here, and joins forces with a German litigator across, you know, across the other side of the planet to argue that uh, a long-term permitter, permitter of greenhouse gases in Germany is affecting his life by melting glaciers. To me, that's mind-blowing because to me, climate change is a wake-up call of our global citizenry, that we're all sharing this air, we're all affected by each other, and there is justice to be brought in that context that has never been brought before, and climate change is forcing us to address it. And this Peruvian farmer who has no legal background, who's never been involved in a lawsuit before, steps up and says, yeah, I'm the guy to do that. I think that changes the game for all of us. Well, am I the person to do something like that? We start to, that question starts to get raised in our minds, and it motivates other people to do all kinds of change. I'm not saying that we're all gonna bring, go out and start bringing lawsuits, but to say, oh, maybe I'm the person to start the composting program at my office, like whatever it is, right? It's a, it's a kind of leadership we see through narrative. Well, if I could yeah, jump please. in, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's exactly right. It's, I, often think, I often think about the impact that strategic climate litigation has on the, on the sort of social narrative, right? And because on the one hand, you're talking about how uh, film and TV and uh, stories can influence decision makers in the courtroom context, but then I think that the people bringing the lawsuits are also thinking about how can the lawsuit that we're bringing influence decision makers outside of the outside of the courtroom as well as inside of it. And the case that Camilla was uh, involved in, like the other youth-based uh, youth plaintiff cases, the Juliana case here in the United States, I think have had a major impact on the way that people understand and think about the nature of the climate crisis. To come back to a point that Camilla raised earlier, you know, at one point in time, it was uh, a technocratic uh, problem that was far off in time and place. It was about uh, polar bears and it was about the year 2100. And now I think a lot more people understand that it's about people living now 
Um, it's about our lives now. It's about our communities now. Uh, it's about justice and injustice now. Um, and it's about the actions that people are taking now. And these cases have been instrumental, I think, in shifting that consciousness by putting youth, by putting today's communities front and center. And crucial to that is the science. One of the questions I get often asked is, how have advances in science uh, influenced climate litigation? Are these cases being brought now because the science is changing? And I think that the, the answer to that oftentimes is, is yes. It's not a one-to-one -one direct causal connection, but the, the more that the science is there to support drawing connections between actions undertaken by corporate or government actors uh, and the the impacts experienced by individuals and communities and localized jurisdictions, the, the, the more solid and sound the litigation is and the stronger the story. Well, let's pick up on the science and dig in a little more deeply. Michael, just to your point, you know, you've worked and colleagues at Saban have worked on building an attribution science literature database and looking at the scholarship of attribution science and its relevance to climate law, climate litigation. Um, so maybe you could say a few words about what attribution science is, why it matters uh, in courts of law, and what if it's sort of what you've done, and what if any evidentiary gaps uh, remain uh, that that scientists can fill. Well, I'm, I'm sure that you or many others in this room could better describe attribution science um, th than I can. But I mean, what I what I'll what I'll say is that the you know climate science, attribution science, detection and attribution science. Um, across the spectrum has been central to climate litigation from the get-go. It's not a matter of, well, the climate science was behind and now it's caught up and so now there are cases. Um, science is always at the heart of environmental, natural resources and energy law. Um, the ability of governments to make decisions, the ability to tie causal chains together, that's endemic to, um, to environmental and therefore climate litigation. So it has always been a central component of it. Um, as the you know, confidence levels and certainty levels have improved uh, and increased. Um, you know, I think that litigators feel greater comfort in going to court um, seeking redress. Um, and oftentimes that's, uh, as I mentioned before, just sort of drawing those causal connections between um, emissions from particularized sources. And there are a range of ways in which you can attribute emissions to different sources, whether they be jurisdictions at a national or subnational level, whether they be industries or corporate actors within those industries um, or sectors. You know, there's a, a range of methodologies to attribute the emissions uh, and we call that source attribution. And drawing the connection from that, you know, to the changes in global composition, uh, atmospheric composition to changes in um, climatic conditions of heat and sea level and sea levels and otherwise to particularized events um, and then through to the impacts that are experienced by by individuals each step of that chain is is crucial at various stages in litigation whether it's establishing standing for an individual to stand up in court and say I have the right to be here, whether it's um, holding an actor accountable um, for their past actions and attributing damages to them, um, or else uh, imp you know, imposing or recognizing forward-looking obligations for their reduction of emissions and their contributions, the, the science is central to all of that. In terms of the gaps, um, you know, I, I think that uh, on the front end, there's still more work to be done uh, in increasing the the level of confidence uh, and, this, and the methodologies for um, attributing emissions to particular actors. And on, the, and on the other end of the spectrum, you know, I think that there are a lot of confounding factors that play into individual experiences of climate-related climate impacts. Um, and so sort of figuring out how to sort through that uh, to um, understand best how connected individual impacts are to to climate change and to those responsible for it. Um, there's, some, there's some work to be done there. Thank you for that. I, I want to just make a note that the National Academies, and I believe it was 2016, um, produced a consensus report on attribution science that was really quite foundational in kind of a, assessing the state of attribution, climate attribution science as it existed at that time, almost a decade ago. And uh, uh, the academies are um, about to launch a new report uh, and there's just been a um, uh, uh, expert nomination announcement 
uh, for an updated report on attribution science. Um, and I believe the kind of domains of expertise include uh, environmental law and policy uh, in terms of thinking about what might be called applied attribution science and its relevance to decision making in courts as well as other uh, domains of decision making. And so I just wanted to encourage listeners uh, uh, who might be interested in this to take a look at the uh, Academy's uh, nomination process and participate if it, if it makes sense to you. The, the first report was really foundational. I have no doubt this one will be uh, important as well for many related purposes. Camilla, I want to I want to turn to you. Um, your your work um, in particular, I think, has shown that that climate change impacts many areas of, of law outside of what might be called climate law in a narrow sense and uh, as traditionally defined. And I, I wanted to ask you to talk more about that and, 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 and about um, kind of the intersection of climate litigation um, with broader societal inequities uh, and the potential role of, and perhaps the limits of climate litigation informed by science in, in addressing climate injustices. Big question, but thank you, thank you for that. Um, you know, I want to pick up on something Michael said about science and beyond attribution science. I see this as a conversation, right, between judges and litigators and scientists, because most judges are generalists, right? They may ha they have heard of climate change. They may still think it has to do with ozone, the ozone layer. Maybe not. Hopefully not, right? They understand it's 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 related to greenhouse gas emissions. But let's be realistic. They're generalists. They're really smart people, but they're generalists. And so I see the role of litigators here to engage with the science and actually be able to communicate it and like have, have a mastery of it that you know allows them to support the claims they're making, but ultimately um, sort of grounds it right in a way that's that's digestible. And so you know I think in our case in Colombia, the science was such an important part. Like we used IPC science, but we also so we're um, relying on government produced science. We were relying on the national reports that Colombia every five years presents you know, to the international community at the climate negotiations. And I think when you're especially bringing a case against the government, when it's their own data, you know, there's not much they can say about it. There's no much debate there. It's like, oh, your own climate scientists are saying that, you know, this is the way in which climate will impact uh, drinking water. This is the way in which the coastal region will experience sea level rise. And so I think it's really important for lawyers and scientists to come together in this in this cross interdisciplinary dialogues, right? We learn a lot about the Amazon forest, and of course it matters for climate, but it also matters for like water cycle purposes, right? There's all this, of course, like ecological, um, you know, uh, implications, and and in that dialogue, really again translate that to a judge, so that this kind of big ideas about climate science and emissions become really real, and ultimately about the harms that the plaintiffs are going to face. So that's just, I just wanted to add an example of why, of how science matters. Um, you know, some of my work is actually on climate migration and displacement, which came up in the previous panel. Um, there were some questions about, you know, another, <laughs> one other facet of, of climate change. And I think um, this is a really interesting place where we're seeing litigation um, and climate displacement come up. So I'll give you an example. So last um, month, or two months ago, um, the Colombian Constitutional Court had a case in front of them saying, look, um, there's a couple of farmers that have been displaced because of flooding. And this flooding has gotten worse because of climate change. And we know that because the science is telling us that. And they actually you know, sued um, the government and said, you're not protecting us from being displaced, which it's not just climate, but climate's a big part of the story, right? Um, and you know, sort of similar theories have had been used. And for the first time, the constitutional court says, Yes, you're right. Climate displacement is a reality that the country has ignored. Um, you know, an example I bring a lot is the movie Encanto, the Disney movie. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, it's a wonderful movie, and it's, it's a movie that really starts with the story of displacement because of violence and conflict, which, you know, for courts has been easier to understand. Like, oh, there's, you know, there's political violence that has led to people be displaced, and so the government has an obligation to help those people. What my work tries to do is say, yeah, but it's, sometimes it's not just violence. Climate is a big part of the story, increasingly so, um, you know, and we have to think about what the law can do for climate displaced communities. And this may be internally, like in, in Colombia, or across, you know, across borders, which, you know, refugee law, immigration law, international human rights law has a lot to say about that. But so I see increasingly these connections between, you know, climate science, climate modeling, human rights law, constitutional law, and the courts. Um, so, 
I have one more question for the panel, but I want to take this time now to invite those of you in the room who have questions uh, to make your way to the microphone uh, in the aisle. Um, and um, we'll turn to Q&A, um, both from the in-person and uh, virtual audience uh, in, in a few minutes. Remember, uh, for those online, um, please add your questions to the Slido queue so we can, we can incorporate them. Um, and please add your name and uh, uh, say your name when you, when you uh, make your question and, and concisely ask your question so we can get to as many as possible. But before, before we turn to audience questions, I want to just ask you to um, expand a little more on the opportunities and perhaps the challenges for scientists who are interested in not just doing policy relevant science, but we'll call it broadly litigation uh, relevant science to engage. What, what are the the opportunities, what are the challenges, what are the ways in which scientists who are interested in this space uh, might participate, any advice that you have for, for folks in the climate science community? Um, yeah. Michael? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, and I appreciate your mentioning the, the resource that we put together at the Sabin Center at climateattribution.org that sort of seeks to pull together law and policy relevant attribution science in one in one place. Um, I mean, one thing you could do is if you, if you go there and you see that we're missing something of yours or something of your colleagues, you can let us know. Um, the, the Union of Concerned Scientists has a science hub for climate litigation, which is a great sort of network or hub um, for uh, scientists who are interested in sort of getting engaged in, in litigation in particular. Um, I think you know, many scientists, um, uh, individual scientists may be contacted by uh, litigators uh, who are looking for experts to participate in individual cases. And there are pros and cons to that, obviously, and that's something for every individual to consider if, if that opportunity should arise. There are ample opportunities, I think, for scientists to get engaged in, in particular policymaking contexts. Um, you know, whether it be at the state level, the local level, or the federal level through contribution of knowledge and expertise. Um, and, and one thing that I'll say is, um, you know, more generally, um, and I, it may be that we come back to this point later as well, you know, as I mentioned before, climate science has been central to climate litigation and, and to climate law and policy from, from the outset. And a lot of that is not due to sort of particularized efforts to shape policy, but just through the conduct of the science itself. And so I think that there is a great deal of value and importance to sort of the pursuit of the, the, the scientific endeavor in and of itself in order to help give the knowledge background um, to, to inform decision making. Maybe I'll just pick up on the last part of what you said and answer a slightly different question, which is, you know, I feel very grateful for having benefited from federal funding for my research in this space. And I think that there are probably many scientists who um, can benefit from the resources you just outlined, but could also benefit from such support. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for agencies to pull together and to try to define some, uh, some scope of research funding that could support scientists who really do want to do this kind of work and who maybe haven't done it before, don't know exactly how it should go, where should they, what research questions should they be answering, what methods do they need to use, those kinds of things. I would never advocate for scientists to break their disciplinary norms or um, change their disciplinary standards. I think adhering to those to the utmost is fundamental, but I do think the research questions and design can also accommodate some of these questions that are arising in the courts, especially for scientists who do want to create knowledge that actually uh, supports judicial decision-making. And so I do think um, I would just love to see a research uh, agenda brought by the, um, a research funding agenda brought by any number of federal agencies to really help move um, science in the direction of being able to serve this branch of the government. Thank you. Camila. I don't know if I have um, much else to add, but I do think encouraging, you know, scientists to engage with other disciplines. And I think lawyers are awful at doing this. Like we love to talk to other lawyers, right? But I think this interdisciplinary dialogue is essential when from the beginning of thinking about a case, but also like really understanding and translating that knowledge. Because again, so much gets lost sort of in these detailed, you know, reports, which is in incredibly important. And right, I know I don't want to undermine that, but there's so much more work. And I think we have to do to, to create narratives, to capture the public's imagination. The cases are doing that, but the science is in 
essential part of that as well. So much. So let's turn uh, to audience questions, and we'll start with um, an online question, if we may. Yes. So our first question from the audience is, is there a pathway for physicians as subject experts on health impacts from climate change to volunteer to testify in court cases? Um, I, I think that I mentioned the UCS uh, hub. That may be one resource to tap into. Um, you know, I think that if the, the question was physicians um, ab about health impacts, um, I, I can't think of another way that an individual would conduct outreach other than to perhaps if if you see a case where you if you read about a case that you think is a potential, where your work could be of potential relevance, you, you might reach out to counsel, um, to, the, to the attorneys working on it or to the organizations that are, that are sort of leading the charge on that case. I guess the only other idea I have is, uh, is there a way that the American Medical Association could put together some kind of committee focused on this type of uh, service to the broader legal community? Um, so for physicians to come together and, uh, and organize to offer their expertise um, so that it's available when, when needed. So let's turn to an in-person question. Yes, I'm Michael Rethlogel, and uh, I'm former Deputy Commissioner of Transportation for New York City. And um, as such, I was invited uh, and served as expert witness in a recent case which was just settled last month in Hawaii uh, where 13 young people aged 8 to 20 sued the State Department of Transportation for its failure to reduce greenhouse emissions and traffic growth uh, and with strong state constitutional language protecting the environment for future generations there was a very strong case to be made and as the case was poised to go to trial rather than getting beat up badly in court, the governor and the state DOT director uh, agreed to settle the case and to uh, develop by next April a decarbonization plan for the transport sector for the state, cutting in greenhouse emissions by half by 2030 and by 100% by 2045 with five-year targets and annual reporting and some other good features. I'm wondering what the panel's opinion is of the need to shift to more state level litigation of climate, given the hostility we're seeing in both the federal courts and frankly at the Justice Department, even under the Biden administration where we've seen the Juliana case uh, suffer from writs of mandamus seven times, unprecedented hostility uh, uh, to dealing with these issues at the federal level. Thank you for your question. Anybody want to take that up? Biased because I briefly worked um, for the Connecticut Supreme Court, and so I think state courts are an essential part um, of, of our legal system. And I think attention historically has been so focused on federal courts that we've forgotten what states can do and, and offer and what state law can do. I think, um, absolutely, to, to your last question, I think the tort litigation that has been brought by states and municipalities is a really amazing example of using traditional like tort principles, right? Consumer protection, nuisance, and saying, hey, fossil fuel industry, you've lied to the public for decades. And that deception, you know, um, led to obviously misinformation around science and disinformation and, and all of this to basically no action at the federal level or sometimes state level, right, on climate. And, and kind of rethinking how do, how do we think about climate accountability using state law, right? And, and I think that's, that has been a very important and strategic um, wave of cases. Um, some have lost, right, last, last week the Baltimore one of the Baltimore cases um, had a less favorable decision, but it's still there's still so much to see um, because because we're early in, in the stages of litigation. So yes, I'm I'm a big fan of of the role of state courts in in you know um, the protection of, of climate and communities. Thank you. Um, let's uh, turn again to the online question. So from the virtual audience. At what point do decisions need to be made by legislators, as hard as that is in the US right now? To what extent do you worry about judicial approaches alienating the public and undermining the legitimacy of courts and the role of legislators over time? 
Well, I mean, I think we all would like to see more legislative action on climate change, period, end of story. I mean, we have been waiting for that, and we have seen some that has been um, incredible, but not enough. And I think that's what's driving so much action, one of the main things driving so much action in the courts. So, yes, and, um, you know, we should all be involved in our democracy in order to motivate this kind of action. I don't, I don't know that there's anything else we can do on that on that front but I'll I'll let one of you deal with the judicial question. Well I think I would I would say that the you know the the decisions we were talking about at the outset of this conversation were very much focused on the the balance of powers between the judicial branch and the executive branch and um, there was kind of this um, call implicit in what the Supreme Court has has done of late uh, on Congress to be much more specific in um, setting forth regulatory uh, mandates. And uh, in that sense, I think that absolutely, we, we want Congress to step up and follow up the Inflation Reduction Act and the IIJA with some climate legislation that sets forth regulatory mandates to complement the invest and um, tax, the invest and incentivize approach of the IRA. Um, and in many ways, that's, that's kind of what the, the court is, is calling on Congress to do through these, through these recent decisions. So let's turn back to the microphones. Hi, um, as a fellow environmental attorney, very curious. First of all, thank you for this incredibly timely and valuable conversation. Um, you know, we know that legal precedent is a tool to be used. And I think a lot of us in environmental law have been very concerned about what these new precedents that have been recently established by the Supreme Court mean for the future of environmental law. But I'm curious what opportunities you all see for proactive litigation to potentially use these new precedents in a proactive way in this field um, to make forward progress on environmental law? Challenging question. That's a good one. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that it, there, there are two immediate thoughts that I have. One is that um, sort of in line with an earlier question, the, the turn to the, to the subnational is, is important, right? We, we, we know that there will be resistance in the federal courts uh, to sort of not explicitly mandated regulatory action uh, when it comes to climate, environmental, and other public protections. Um, and that means that there may well be greater opportunities at the state level, particularly uh, in relationship to state tort law and state constitutional law. Um, and I will, I will say that you know, in a uh, prospective future where we see uh, climate deregulation happening again at the federal level, it is possible that these same precedents that have been set forth that many of us are quite concerned about in terms of inhibiting the ability to be progressive um, with climate action may also wind up being somewhat prohibitive of regressive climate action. The only thing I would add to that, which isn't really a, an answer for an environmental lawyer, um, but for those of us who are not environmental lawyers, is, and this is to climate, and I'll just speak beyond my expertise to say it's, it's health, it's everything that these recent support, uh, Supreme Court decisions have, um, you know, offered opportunities for litigation around. And I just would say that for those of us concerned about uh, health and well-being broadly defined, to be educated and engaged in understanding what's going on in the courts in, and being proactive in that sense so that you understand what these new decisions mean for your lives is, is very important um, as some maybe unprecedented changes start to shake out. And so to me, I, I, I heard the key question, uh, the key word in your question being proactive. And to me, that's what you know, citizens of this country can be, is proactive about thinking about and understanding what the courts are doing that may affect their lives. Um, and, and maybe this relates to some kind of uh, suit you engage in, and maybe it doesn't, but just to engage with this third branch of government. So let's turn um, uh, back to the virtual question. Um, since we only have time probably for like one or two more questions, we thought we might do one more oh. audience question. Okay, that's fine. Conversing. Thank you. Audience, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hello, uh, Paul Hanley from the Environmental Law Institute. Good to see you all. 
Uh, and I this is a question for Michael Berger. Um, and uh, uh, what I wanted to do is just note that the Environmental Law Institute runs a project for educating judges called the Climate Judiciary Project about basic climate science. Uh, and we do this uh, cooperatively with uh, the National Judicial College and other official uh, educational institutions. So it's, um, uh, it's widely uh, distributed and it is uh, endorsed by those. And for you, Michael, um, one of the things that we have found is that the judges are, uh, when they're asked what are the topics that they're interested in um, uh, hearing more about, they almost always list in the top three attribution science. Uh, and especially the question that I wanted to ask you is a little bit about the state of uh, source attribution. Uh, you mentioned it just a moment ago, but um, how does it play as you see it? How does it or will it play uh, out in the, the cases? How important is it? And what's the kind of the status of the science itself, source attribution? Well, uh, Paul, good to see you. Um, and, th and thanks for the question. And uh, let me just sort of underscore um, the, the Climate Judiciary Project, which is, which is an excellent um, resource and, and also consistent with work being done by UNEP and Asia Development Bank internationally to also provide sort of scientific training to, to judges um, uh, to, to provide a grounding uh, in, in judicial decision making in, in climate science, which is crucial. Um, the state of source attribution, I would say, um, is a, um, you know, on the one hand, there have been uh, one or two major studies that have been done uh, in the private sector uh, in terms of attributing uh, scope three emissions related to fossil fuel extraction to um, fossil fuel companies. Um, there's also been a great deal of work obviously done over, over the years in terms of national greenhouse gas inventories um, that is, you know, is, is attribute emissions to different sectors within uh, the US and other national uh, and regional economies. Um, and then there's the work at the UNFCCC itself um, you know, and, and sort of the, the international work ar around attributing emissions to different national jurisdictions. Uh, to date, um, we don't have any real basis to, um, to, to sort of say with clarity how this is gonna play out in litigation itself. Um, you know, you can, you can seek to attribute scope three emissions to um, a company, you can seek to attribute direct uh, emissions or scope one and scope two emissions to a company. Uh, you can use territorial emissions or consumption-based emissions for jurisdictional purposes. And forgive me if these are, are technical terms, but I use them really just to sort of flag that there's a great de degree of complexity to the issue and, and it hasn't really been litigated frequently enough yet um, at an evidentiary stage for, for me to make any conclusion about like what's gonna happen or how it'll play out in court. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the excellent panel. Uh, Jairo Garcia, I teach classes at uh, John Hawkins University and Georgia uh, Institute of Technology in climate policies. And obviously the policies, uh, climate policies that I teach are practically based in the Clean Air Act and the Chevron case that were basically you know, moved by the Supreme Court. And this is, this is not new. We knew for years that the Supreme Court, is the, when they have the majority um, um, conservative, we knew that it was coming. This is no surprise. It was just coming. Um, and, and, and I don't understand, yes, they were able to do that, but what happened with the good guys in the law? What we are not getting ready to combat this, it's easy to point the finger to Congress. Oh, Congress is going to do that. That's what exactly they are doing. But what we are doing as, a, as in, in the normal law in order to defend climate and climate policies and see, um, be you know, aware of the problem of climate change, what the, the entire system of, of, of lawyers, environmental lawyers in the United States are doing, I don't know anything about, maybe you can illustrate me. What are you doing to tackle that? If Biden called you and said, give me an advice, what we should do with the Chevron case, what you guys are saying? <laughs> um, no, I, I want to validate what you're saying, and I think is that what we knew this was going to happen because there's been a deliberate effort 
um, right, by, by a certain section of the population to really dismantle the administrative state, um, right, and big government. Um, and again, as someone who took some climate science <laughs> cases at, at courses and understands how complex the science is, even, even although I'm not a scientist, um, I tend to value agency expertise and I tend to value, you know, people who know way more about things that I don't know to make those decisions. Um, and, I, and I think I said this at the outset, which is I see this as a, as a shift in norms. Um, and a shift in power, and that worries me, you know, beyond kind of my law hat. Um, though I, I will say something that I think Michael said today, earlier today, which is Chevron is going to affect some, like a subset of cases, right? It, does, it doesn't affect every environmental case. It doesn't affect every climate case even necessarily. We're talking about cases where agency actions are being challenged and their interpretations of statutes are being challenged. But there's tons of other cases that don't involve federal agencies. They may involve state agencies. They may involve private uh, defendants, corporations, right? So like, I. I it is unprecedented, but I also don't want you to walk away and and, and think that that's it, <laughs> right? That the courts will it will will not protect the climate or, or or people. That's not necessarily, I think, what the takeaway is. But please correct me if I'm wrong. No, not at all. I think you're absolutely right. I think I would just sort of um, maybe go go along those lines and say, if I were, I mean, I think I think that there are a lot of lawyers right now at the Department of Justice and elsewhere who are probably thinking, okay, how do we cabin this decision, right? How do we confine its impact? How do we narrow it in a way that is less harmful um, rather than more harmful? And I think that the one way to do that is to think about the limitations that Camilla just mentioned. That case is about agency interpretations of ambiguous statutes or silence that are sta that statutes that are silent as to a particular issue of law. The court has said that it is the court's authority to determine what the law is. It did not say it's the court's authority to, to determine what policy is or what the right technical answer to any question is. These are not clear boundaries. They're quite fuzzy, especially in agency decision making. But I do think that one strategic output of this will be the attempt to, by agencies, to put less emphasis on legal interpretation and more on policy decision making and the technical and scientific evidence that informs those policy determinations. The more something is a policy determination informed by science and technical analysis, the more insulated it's gonna be um, from, from Loper Bright and its ilk. Thank you, well this has been a really rich conversation and we're going to end it in just a moment, but before we do, I wanna make sure I have an opportunity to ask each of you, as we've done in all of the panels, to offer one last takeaway, if you'd like, uh, for the audience um, on this topic. So, Camilla, let me start with you. Ay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I often people often ask me, and I'm sure people in the audience get asked this all the time. How do you work on climate? Right? How do you not just get totally either paralyzed or just depressed? Um, and I think of my own privilege, right? As an attorney trained in the United States, I'm an immigrant, but. Right, I now have this kind of fancy job and went to fancy schools and all of that. And I think about what am I going to do with my time? And the difference in a, you know, in a two warmer degree world or a three warmer degree world or a four degree world, right? And those are substantial, you guys know this, you guys are, many of you climate scientists. Th those are definitely, vastly different um, scenarios. And so I don't know if this is hopeful, <laughs> but I will have to say that a lot of us, everyone in this room has a lot of privilege, right? And, and I don't think giving up is an option. And I think we all contributed, you know, through filing lawsuits or writing papers, doing good science, right? Um, but I really, I, I really don't think we can afford to give up. And so that's my, those are my two cents. Thank you. Sabrina. Uh, you know, I guess I just want to look at this big picture. You know, we're all here because we're concerned about justice. And justice, I mean, the, the courts are supposed to render justice, but there are many ways to bring justice into focus in our lives. And I think attuning our attention, as I was mentioning in my last comment, to the courts is definitely a way that I think we need to more in America, especially right now and do that in the way that's most interesting to you, but to become more attentive to the courts, but also to think about what does justice mean for you in your own lives in the context of climate change. And there's a lot of different ways to think about that, but I think that's what we're here for. And 
as long as we have that as a goal and we are each taking our different path forward towards justice, I think we will be successful in some way. Michael, last word. Um, every court in the world will look at the IPCC reports as an authoritative statement on the state of climate science. And every court will look at national climate assessments for the most part as authoritative statements of climate science. Um, I think that for scientists in the room seeking out opportunities to engage in you know, policy and legal contexts makes a lot of sense. And I definitely encourage you to, to, to do that. Um, but there is, a, there is an underlying element to this, which is that the foundational science, the basic science, the cutting edge science uh, in attribution and other aspects of, of the climate domain um, are highly impactful in government and judicial decision making, and we need that work to continue. So I guess my, my final piece of it would be to you know, seek your avenues to um, drive impact and keep on doing what you're doing. All right, well, please join me in thanking our panelists for this.